morning, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our service this morning. We just want to spend some time in praise and worship this morning, lifting up the name of Jesus because he is worthy of our praise, isn't he? Lord in heaven, we come to you this morning and we're so thankful for this opportunity that you have blessed us with today. Lord God of heaven, to be alive and to be able to come to this place, and not only able, but a desire in our heart to come to this place and worship you because you are worthy of all praise. My Lord of heaven, as we begin this service this morning, we begin with a time of praise. We begin with a time of honoring you and lifting you up, Lord God of heaven, because you are worthy of all of our praise. Lord of heaven, we open our hearts right now. We open our minds. We put everything else on the back burner, but you are in our forefront of our thoughts and in our heart right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let behind him the 
and struggle to feel the heat inside. And then at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul. And for the first time, I had hope. Yes. Thank you.
chapter 15 and verse 1. I hope you don't mind if I do a little bit of uh, review. Go right here. Uh, Danny, did y'all find a sheep up here that's laying all the way? Excuse me? Did y'all find a sheep up here? Uh, no. Like this tall? Oh, no sir. Thank you. I lost my sheep. Oh, oh you put it back in your pocket. Yeah. I did put it back in my yeah. pocket? Well, that explains a lot. That's why it's not anywhere else I look. It's probably in my pocket. Hallelujah. 
The first verse in chapter 15. Then said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. Let's pray. Lord God, we give you praise and glory and honor, and I thank you so much for this time that we have together this morning. I thank you for each and every one that came. Lord, I'm asking that the Holy Spirit would guide us through this, that the Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us. Every one here has a special place, a special purpose. Everyone here has come down a specific road to get to the place they are now. I'm asking, Lord God, that you would speak to each one of us as only you can. Take this simple word, apply it to our hearts, to our mind, to our soul. Help us to find the right direction, to find the strength that we need, the determination, the enlightenment, the revelation that we can press on in these last days and make a difference. Make a stand for you, Lord. We give this to you completely. We confess there's nothing we can do without you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Yes. Amen. So we're talking about the, the certain things that made each one of these men influential with God and to the point that he would say, um, no one can change my mind. Even if these certain men stood before me, my mind couldn't be changed. So they had a special place in, in God's heart and God's mind that there was something special about these men. They gave certain things. They uh, believed... Uh, but, but you can't say that they, they just had faith or they just believed there was something different, there was something special about them that made them have this influence with God. Yes. And when we talked about Moses, we said that there were two things that had Moses stand out. One, that he loved the Lord. And the other was that he loved the people. Yes. yes. And... Um, in Deuteronomy, we said God told Moses to stand aside and I will destroy this people and disinherit them and I will make you a greater nation. And Moses said, no, if you destroy them, destroy me also. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to remember this. These were not good people. These were bad people. Right. They were, they were uh, God called them stiff-necked and hard-headed and uh, he, he, he uh, they, they're the ones that made the golden calf and dashed, after God had brought them out of Egypt with, with miracle on top of miracle, they made a golden calf and said this is the God that brought us out of Egypt this is the kind of people that Moses stood in for, they constantly complained, they always wanted to go back to Egypt I remember uh, Noel was probably 13 or 14, we had, well, I like to feed birds, we had birds to do about and, um, she noticed there was one little bird that, um, well, it was obviously blind. And it didn't weigh, it didn't weigh an ounce. It, it didn't have much longer. It was trying to find its way up to the bird feeder. And it was, well, anyway, Noel goes out and she catches it and we get a cage and she takes it to the doctor and the doctor gives him uh, some, gives her some medicine to put around his eyes. Now, and, and it, it cleared up. It got his vision back. And he couldn't wait to get out of the cage. And I'm sitting there watching him, and I'm thinking, now as long as you're in that cage, you've got all the food you can eat. You've got all the water you can drink. You'll never have to worry about eating and drinking again. As long as you're in that cage, you'll never have to worry about being cold. It's always going to be warm in here. You'll never have to worry about being hot. You'll never have to worry about a predator. You'll never have to worry about any of these things as long as you stay in the cage. You see, the devil wants you to stay in a cage. Yes, he does. It, it, these people, they were willing to go back and live in the cage yes. than to have faith in God to deliver them, right. to work for them, to supply for them, yes. to provide for them. They would rather go back and live in the cage. Amen. We can't yes. stand to have to live by faith. That's right. That's the only way to be free. Yes. Because God is going to require things of all of us is going to require faith. That's right. We say... How come we don't see miracles anymore? What do you do that deserves a miracle anyway? What, what, what do we do that deserves a miracle? I remember the first time 
that I did street work. I was stupid enough to go to Houston. And um, here's, it, this truly is country goes to town. And I get off this van, and the first thing I met with is the demon possessed man. And he says, We don't want you over here. We don't need you over here. We need you to take your stuff. And he didn't know who I was, or he, but except his spirit spoke yes. to my spirit. Yes. We don't want you here. Go to the other side. They yes. need you over there. Yes. And I'm thinking, why am I not back in Redfield? And the the, uh, the guy that, that's with me, he he when he's walking away, he he uh, he looks back and he yells, "Keep the faith." And I thought. This is the first time in my life I have ever had to truly keep the faith because I didn't know what I was walking into. Yes. Yes. Well, Moses stood in for these people anyway. They had become such an attachment to his heart that he didn't want anything to happen to them. And so he said, if you kill them, kill them too. So we have to ask ourselves, what am I committed to? What am I really committed to yes, in serving right. God? Am I committed to a church, a ministry? Am I committed to a denomination? Am I committed to a pastor? Or maybe I'm committed to one or all of these things. But I have to ask myself, what am I committed to? Because you see, the flesh can be so very deceitful. Yes, it can. We can say, I'm, I'm doing all my studies because I, I want to serve the Lord. I'm doing all of this because I want to serve God. I have all this because I want to serve God. But actually, that's not the way it is at all. Yes. Because I have to ask myself, what about the people? You remember when we talked about last, last Sunday? What about the people? What do the people need? Am I doing things for the people? I, I remember as a young Christian, and this is, this is true, I'm not bragging, I'm, I'm telling you the um, how bad it was. I prayed two hours a day every day. I made a point to go out at 8 o'clock in the morning and I prayed till 10. And uh, now this is what it done for me. I would go to a, a fellowship meeting and I'd say, nobody here prays like I do. Mm -hmm. Yes. You see how the flesh could be? Yes. Nobody here knows God like I do. Mm -hmm. So it was all for nothing. Right. It was all for nothing. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all this. I'm saying it's for God, but no, it's for me. It's all for me. He said, we can go to church. We can get dressed up. We can do all these things, and we can say it's for God, but it's all for me. I've got to answer this issue. I have got to come to the point where I can look at myself in the mirror and say, what are you truly doing? It's a fair question. When you pray and you ask God for this or that, God is going to come back with the question, what are you going to do with it? right he will Lord I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost what are you going to do with that mm -hmm. do you want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost so you can further the ministry of the Lord that's it Lord God I need a healing but what are you going to do with it yeah. come on I've seen people get a healing and they leave church yes I've seen the people, I've seen folks have their financial needs met in a miraculous way and in less than a year they were out of church yes, yes. God says, what are you going to do with it? If I give you this, what are you going to do with it? Yes. That's a fair question from God. Yes, it is. Amen. And I have to learn to answer these things truthfully. Yes. You know, there are lies we like to hear. And a lot of those lies we tell to ourselves. Amen. God's investment is in people. And Moses knew that. One guy told me, he said, I would preach, but he said, I don't like people. I said, well, you don't need to get into it then. I'm sure you don't. Yeah, I would preach, but I don't like people. Sometimes it's too many people. Moses understood that God loved the people too. Yes, he did. And Moses wanted to do what God wanted him to do. Yes, he did. Yes. Now, that's what made him special among other men. Look, could I answer God the way Moses did? 
If they don't go, I don't go. Could I answer God in the same way? I'm going to destroy these people. Listen, they're not going to be any more trouble to you. They're not going to try to stab you in the back. They're not going to grumble, gripe, and complain about everything. I'm going to do away with them, and I'm going to raise you up and give you a better people than them. Could we say, no, Lord, they're my people. Yes. Think about it. Well, could I stand with my church family even when they're not so good would I stand with them yes. would I stand beside them <clears throat> what about my own family you know we can get so mad at our own our own brothers and sisters our own mom can I stand beside them and say the same thing Lord if you don't take them don't take me am I willing to fight to the last breath for my church family and for my family. Yes. Well, that's Moses. The last one is Samuel. At the heart of Samuel's ministry and much of what it took to shape him into a man of rare influence with God was when the people wanted to replace God as their king and put a man in his place. And as outrageous as this sounds, but I mean, they had God as their president. Can you imagine having God as the president of the United States? Gee, that'd be wonderful. That would be great. Having God as the president of the United States. But we have to without the Lord, would we? Yeah. Always perfect judgment. No scandal. Don't have to worry about anything at all. Cause good. But they, they wanted to get rid of God. They wanted to elect a man. Mm -hmm. And so they could... Um, you know, it, it, it's about the, the the crown and the throne and the king's royal subjects and all the fancy stuff, you know, like the foolishness they do in, in uh, England with uh, their king and queen stuff, which doesn't, it's nothing but tradition and amounts to nothing. And uh, that's what they wanted. Samuel hated it. Yes. He hated that idea. He wanted to have no part of it. He knew that it was wrong. Mm -hmm. But God told Samuel, he said, their minds are made up. You know, sometimes you know that God doesn't want you to do it. You know that it's the wrong thing to do, but your mind is made up. Yep. No matter how many people warn you about it, no matter how much wisdom is given you concerning it, it doesn't make any difference. Your mind is made up. You're going to do it anyway. And God does this with his people too. Yes, he does. If your mind is made up, go ahead. You know you're going against my will, but your mind is made up. Go ahead and do this, and when you learn your lesson, you can come back. Yes. That's how God works. Yes, he does. That's why some of you got in such a mess before. Yes. That's why I got in so many messes. Yes. I had my mind made up, and God said, well, go ahead and go. And God told him, he said, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They have rejected me. That's right. And so Samuel knew it was going to fail, and he had to live with that. And you know the story of how Saul was chosen to be king, and Samuel was having to serve during a time that God's will had been set aside, and the people were moving in the wrong direction. They were moving away from the will of God. And you know, it's hard enough to serve, but it's doubly hard to serve when you know the direction that you're taking is going to end in regret. And I thought, we're kind of there today, aren't we? We know the direction that things are taking in this country and in the world is going to end in regret. Yes. Every time we see something on the news, we think about, is this part of the last days? Um, is this a sign of the end of time? Is, could this be another part that says that the days here are limited? I was, uh, I think I was telling Sherry yesterday that in the 60s, you know, there was the, there was always someone carrying a sign, the end is near, right? Yes. Uh, repent because the, the end is near. And I, I told Sherry, I said, they didn't really mean any harm. It's just they were looking around. They seen how bad things had become. Yes. And they said, this, this can't go on. I said, but they had no idea yes. how bad how it was awesome. actually going to get. Yes. They had no idea 
how bad that it was actually going to get. And Sherry asked me, she said, well, can it get worse than this? Can, it get, can things get worse than they are now? What do you think? Yes, they can. Well, so we know that the direction that we've taken in this country is go it's going to end badly yes. one way or another. Yes. So what did Samuel do? <coughs> I think I got that for you here. Samuel chapter 12 and verse 19. For all the people said to Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God that we die not, for we have added unto all our sins this evil in asking for a king. Yes, they realize. We have messed up. Yes. Hmm. And Samuel said, Fear not, ye have, you have done all this wickedness, yet. Turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Now, that's exactly what should be said. Yeah, you messed up. Yep. What you've done is terrible. What you've done is irreparable. There couldn't be a much bigger sin than, than kicking God out of a position and putting a man in his place. Right. Yes. Amen. But you keep serving the Lord. He said, And turn not aside, for then should you go after vain things which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. If I continue to turn aside, I'm going to get worse and worse. That's what he's saying. If you yeah. don't focus on the Lord, you just think this was a bad decision. You think yes, this was a man. mistake. You can only imagine the mistakes that you're going to make if you, if you don't pay attention and serve God. Okay, now, this is important. Samuel was not a child of tradition. He came in with a clean slate. Most of us, um, if we don't come in with tradition, we are taught one. Um, you know, like I, I, I had no church experience. I, I didn't know the church songs. I really wanted to sing the, the church. I didn't know them. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know who Paul was. I didn't know anything about I didn't know anything about anything. And um, so you're taught things. You're taught church etiquette. You're taught um, denominational do's and don'ts. You're taught certain things in certain ways that you're supposed to act. There's certain rights and wrongs, you see. You're taught these things. And the point is, we end up doing these things without question. But I want you to remember this. We don't serve a religious base. We serve Jesus Christ. That's right. And whatever may your denomination may be, it's here, but my service to Jesus Christ is up here. Yes. I want to know his mind. I want to know what his thinking is. I want to know what he's saying is right or wrong. I'm not depending on men to guide me. I want to know what he's saying. That's right. Amen. This is who I'm sold out to. Yes. Not the name of something. I want to know his thoughts. And Samuel was close enough to God to see what others could not. Because you see, it's so easy to follow the crowd. Yes, it is. <coughs> That's what made Samuel different. Yes. So, the real issue <coughs> is not only these five men have nothing in common, but the thing that they did have in common was that they were alone in their particular situation and they were alone because of their relationship with God. Yes. That's what made them alone. And that's one thing that Christians today, they really fight against. They like being popular. Yes. They like being known. Yes. They like being someone special among a group of people. Mm -hmm. And God is really sifting through people today trying to find folks that would rather have fellowship with him than other people. Yes, amen. That's what that's where we grow in the Lord is when fellowship with him becomes more important. Yes. Doing things for him 
becomes more important than doing things for people. Yes, amen. What people think about us doesn't matter as much as what God knows about us. Amen. Okay? The people all around them had religion, and we talked about that last week, that you can have religion and not be saved. That's right. The religion is nothing more than a strict adherence to a certain set of rules. I've seen this morning where Muslims, they are told that they must pray. Now, some say it's five times a day, but I, I know it's three times a day. They bow down and they face toward this thing at Mecca or whatever, but that, they have to do that. Yeah. That's a rule, and uh, there are penalties if you don't do that. I don't have to pray at all. God doesn't force me to pray. That's right. God doesn't force me to go to church. No. He doesn't force me to pay my tithes. He doesn't force me to sing when it's time to sing. He doesn't force me to worship when it's time. He doesn't force me to do anything because God wants it to come from the heart. Yes. He wants right. it to be Amen. real. Yes. He wants it to come from you because yes. you want yes. to worship, yes. because you want to go to church. Amen. You sense the need to go yes. to church. Amen. I need to draw close to God. I need yes. him. Yes. We think that when we go to church, we're doing something for God. You better change that idea. Amen. I go to church because I need to get close to God. We talked about walking in the Spirit is simply wanting to do God's will. That's walking in the Spirit. Let me read you a verse here. <clears throat> Romans 6 and 18. Being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. I like that. Yes. That always gripped me. You know, more than anything else, Christian people consider themselves the servants of sin, of some sin, some weakness in their life. But this is saying that the Christian becomes a servant to righteousness. Yes. yes. How right. can that be? Well, let me tell you, let me tell you this. What if what if Ricky said, I don't have $50. What if Ricky said, I'll give someone $50 to stand up and use God's name in this church? I wonder how many would do it. Mm -hmm. Amen. Why? Why wouldn't you do it? Because it says not to. Some things you can't do. That's right. You see? When you become the servant of righteousness, there, it's not a rule that says you can't do it. There's some things you just can't do. That's right. It's not a rule that says you're going to be whipped if you do this. Or you're going to be imprisoned if you, or you're going to be uh, cast away. It's, it's, it's not like that. There are things that you just can't do in your life. That's right. That's becoming a servant of righteousness. It's not that you're scared. It's that you can't. I can't do it. I can't say that. I can't go there. I can't become a... Why can't you? Because you are becoming the servant of righteousness. It yes, is going to take over. And you'll find out that there are other things that you simply won't be able to do anymore. Amen. Yes, you just right. can't do it. Amen. Yeah. And I did want to bring this up one more time because, uh, and then we'll get into new stuff. I wanted to show you what a lot of well-meaning Christians are today. I've had a good day today. There are no slip-ups. That's why I'm a good Christian and God is pleased. And on the other hand, I have had a bad day today. I slipped up a couple of times. I'm a bad Christian and God is not pleased. And that's the majority of of well-meaning Christian. That's the, that, that's the majority of their lives. That's yes. how they live their Christian life. Yes. God never intended that. Jesus didn't come and die on the cross so you could live a life of condemnation. That's right. You know, there is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus and are called according to his purpose. Those who are walking in the Spirit. You see, I'm going to win victory over whatever sin may I may struggle with. I'm going to win victory if I just keep the faith. That's right. Amen. I'm going to overcome it. That's right. That's just going to happen. <coughs> All I have to do is continue to walk in faith. Yes. 
That's the power of God. And when you do overcome this thing, you can say it's nothing I did. God did this for me. Amen. So, we did talk about no matter what we do, how good it is, that if we do it with the wrong motives, God doesn't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, if I do happen to slip up, but if my heart is in the right place, if I'm not wanting to do that, I just happen to slip up, God still counts that as righteousness because in my heart, I want to do right. Yes. Amen. In my heart, I want to serve God. Yes. Listen, I, I've met people before, and they struggle with, oh, let's say cigarettes. They struggle with cigarettes. Couldn't they? Couldn't couldn't they? Just couldn't beat it. Couldn't get it out of their life. They they and, and I, if the Lord said, okay, I'll give you ten thousand dollars or deliver you from cigarettes, what would you take? In a second, they'd say cigarettes. That's how bad they want. To be delivered. And I promise you there are. There are people. And, well. And I'll go ahead and say this. Most of the time. Uh, that they struggle with this so long. It goes on and on in their lives. <coughs> because and I'll say. Has God already delivered you before? Well yeah. How many times? Well twice. Well you know. Each time. You take that deliverance and throw it away, the next time it's going to have a little greater price to it. Yes. You're going to have to learn your lesson. You're going to have to learn. I'm, I'm, if I ever get rid of this again, God, you got me. Yes. Whatever it may be. Okay, the three phobias, and then we'll get back into some new stuff. Satan uses three phobias to de derail a well being Christian. One is fear that comes from the past. Past mistakes can haunt you. Yes, they can. Fear of present mistakes, some weakness that you can't shake. The condemnation is relentless. You're a hypocrite. What's the point in praying? You're no good. God's not going to listen to you pray. You're wasting your time. And then third is fear of the future. The enemy whispers, you'll never make it. I've had all of these said to me before. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I know. Yeah. You're never going to make it. What's the point of continuing? That's right. There's uh, about 30, about 34 years ago, I read a story about uh, a, a, it was a, a well-established church. It wasn't a very big church, but it had a new pastor. And um, the new pastor was taking them in the direction God wanted them to go. And uh, the church election was coming up, and the church was kind of split down the middle because... A lot of these people, they didn't want to go the direction the pastor was taking them, even though it was the godly direction. And the other, the other half, they wanted him to go, and the enemy was behind all of this. Yes. And so the enemy, they, they come together. Satan comes, and he tells some of his workers, he said, okay, he said, the, the little old lady that lives on Fifth Street, he said, I want you to do everything you can to stop her, because once if she ever gets here, she's going to tip everything in the direction of righteousness. And I thought, I wonder how many of you would like to be in the category of that little old lady. Yes, that's right. Yes. But then I have to ask you why. Why would you like to be in that position? You see, any direction you choose to follow God, the devil is going to say, are you sure this is the direction you want to take? That's right. There's a price. There's a cost. Are you sure this is the direction you want to take? Would you like to be heard because you can be known, so you can be seen, so you can be something special? Or would you like to be like her because you want to see God's will from the past, no matter how difficult it may be? <clears throat> we have to get down to these these issues. Amen. I need what God wants from me. 
there are two enemies that I have to deal with that comes in close. Yes. You know, we are, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Wrestlers come in close to each other. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yes. It's just them one against the other. And that's what it comes down to sometimes when Christians are growing. Yes. The first one is we have, we know that Satan will stop at nothing to hinder. His intentions are to wear you down because we tend to make bad decisions when we're tired. Mm -hmm. He'll wear you down and he'll push you to make a decision. Yes. You see, anyone, now listen to this, anyone that's thinking about backsliding, the enemy has already got through your mind. Yes, he has. They're already not thinking right. Right. Anytime someone is thinking about backsliding, already the enemy has got to your mind. You're not thinking right. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Was was the was the prodigal son thinking right when he left home? No, he was not. He left prime rib for pig slop. That's right. How smart is that? <laughs> he left love for loneliness. He left robes for rags. Was he thinking right? No. Come on. It's true. So the enemy pushes you to make bad decisions. The second thing is our own flesh. Your own flesh is against you. Your own flesh comes to church with you. Your own flesh goes to prayer with you. Your own flesh goes everywhere you go. He go the, the flesh goes with you to read your Bible, to study your Bible. Yes. Your flesh goes with you to discipline your children. Your flesh goes with you everywhere you go. And your flesh does not want to be spiritual. No, it does not. You see, the flesh and the world are tied together. They're two peas in a pod. Because what, everything the world has, the flesh wants. Yes. And so the flesh never wants to completely cut ties with the world because the world has all of these things for us. What are you going to do when it comes down to the time when we simply have to get rid of TV? Mm -hmm. Because it has gotten so bad that we have to get rid of it. I've, I've noticed a few times they're cussing on advertisements now. Yeah. They're advertising things and they're cussing during the advertisement. I wonder how much are we going to... Now, see, I, I know I'm, I'm talking crazy. TV out of the house. <laughs> you got to be kidding me, preacher. <laughs> I got satellite, man. I paid $100 a month for my TV. I got 787 channels. And I watched probably three of them. I couldn't pull your TV out with a four-wheel drive. But the question is still there. What is it going to take to make me say enough is enough? Yes. But see, the flesh is saying, and they said, Raider back, Daniel. Mm -hmm. See, the flesh, first thing the flesh says is all the things you're going to miss. When you, when, you, when you invite someone to come to church, what's the one of the first things they bring up? Well, I don't want to quit this. You see, the flesh immediately jumps up. The flesh immediately wants to take over the conversation. Well, I'm not ready to give this up yet. That's right. Anything that you want to do for God, the flesh is going to immediately come up and take over the conversation. Oh, but no, you don't want to do it out there. Oh, if you don't have this, you won't be able to do this. You see, the, we, and we have the flesh with us all the time. It's a constant battle as long as you're it's a, it's a battle from now to the grave. Yes, it is. Uh, I, I heard a story where a grandfather gave his grandchild, five-year-old grandchild, a five-dollar bill and he said, here's a five-dollar bill. Get ready to worry about money the rest of your life. That's true, isn't it? Yes. Y'all might be wealthy enough. You don't worry about money, but I'm not. <laughs> right. Amen. I'm still nervous when I open up the light bill. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, Paul said, I die to myself daily. That's what it takes. Yes. I die to myself daily. Amen. There are certain things I just don't allow the flesh to have, the flesh yes. to do. The prodigal failed because he was, the world was calling and he was listening. But I want to show you a side of the flesh that is just as dangerous, but it's twice as deadly. There are three times in Scripture where God struck men dead, and all three of them were during religious exercises. 
one, if you'll remember, Uzzah reached up to steady the ark, mm -hmm. and God killed him immediately. That's right. The other time, um, Nadab and Abihu, mm -hmm. Aaron's sons, you know, God started a fire. A fire came down yes. from heaven. And God started this, this fire. It was holy fire. Yes. And they were supposed to use this fire to start uh, the sacrifices, yes. one of the sacrifices. Well, they just didn't pay any attention to this. They just got their own fire. They built their own fire. It's just a fire. You know, fire is a fire. That's what they said. And they just started their own fire. And God killed them. That's right. Instantly. Ananias and Sapphira. Mm -hmm. They sold the land. And they come back and said, here's the money for the land we sold, but it was only half. I mean, they gave half the money, but they didn't use all the money. They pretended to give up. Now, th this is my point. Th this is why it's twice as dangerous. Playing church yes. can kill you dead. Yes, it can. Playing church, just playing church, it can kill you dead. It, it can make you to where you can't hear God, you can't feel his presence. There is no message going to reach your spirit. You are completely dead to the things of God, just playing church, playing the game. And this is God's warning throughout the Bible. You just play the game. Mm -hmm. It's very dangerous. Yes, it is. To just come and play church. Now, Moses, Job, Daniel, Noah, and Samuel, they all fought the battles. They all fought these battles, and they were all hard-fought battles. They were among the loneliest people on the earth. They were among the most misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And they were among the most hated because of who they belonged to. Yes, that's right. Paul said, and any one of these could have said that, he said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have stayed on course. Now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Yes. I have fought a good fight. You know, one of the greatest things that could ever be said is someone on their deathbed saying, I fought a good fight. Mm -hmm. yes. I've stayed on course. I've yes. kept the faith. Yes. That's victory. Yes. I don't care how they live. I don't care what they live in. I don't care what they drive. I don't care what kind of clothes they wear. If they can lay down and say, I have fought a good fight, yes. I've stayed the course, and yes. I've kept the faith. That's victory. Yes, yes, it is. Josephus, he said that at Paul's execution, he said that Paul reached down and grabbed the executioner's hand and shook it, saying, you have no idea what you're about to do for me. I would like seeing the, the look on the executioner's hand. Yes. And Paul shook his hand. It obviously excited. You have no idea what you're about to do for me. There are rewards. Right? Yes, there are. Sometimes the enemy would like you to forget there are rewards, but there are rewards. There certainly are rewards for me on this side, but the greatest reward awaits us on the other side. And I thought, to finish this up, I, I want to describe just a small part of this too. The wall surrounding the city is 144 cubits. That's about 216 feet thick. This is the, round, the wall that surrounds the city. Yes. It's made of pure jasper. So it's two-thirds of a football field thick, but someone on the other side, you can see them through the wall being this big. The city itself measures 12,000 furlongs. That would mean that the height and the length and the width would be about 1,500 square miles. 1,500 miles each way. 1,500 square miles. That's the city. These, there are 12 foundations or 12 floors. Each one of these is separated by a distance of 125 miles. So the second story, the second floor, would be out of sight to the natural eye. 
The uh, Empire State Building, I think, is 1,500 feet high. This is 125 feet high to the first floor. <coughs> now, let me show you something. If the city were divided into rooms, and each room was one mile square, one mile high, one mile wide, one mile deep, there would be 3 billion, 375 million rooms in this city. Each one occupying one square mile. Now I know I'm a nerd, but listen to this. If we were to begin at the creation of Adam, spending one hour in each room, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at the end of 6,000 years, we would have visited 52,570,560 rooms, leaving 3,322,529,440 rooms left to visit. And here's the thing. This city is all made of gold. Yes. That's just a city. That's what God has planned for us. Now I ask you, is there anything worth missing out on this? Anything that the world has to offer? No. Wouldn't it be wonderful just to see this? Yes. Just to see it? Now each one of us has a job to do, a purpose to fill. Do you remember uh, the Philippian jailer that praying for Paul to come? Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And I thought, there are some of you here this morning that the enemy has, is very, very concerned about. And what if there was someone praying for God to send somebody and that somebody was you? Yes. Somebody is needing something. Yes. And God is waiting to send you. Mm -hmm. How long would he have to wait? Yes. I, I have to ask myself these questions. There's some of you that the enemy is very concerned with. There's something about you that scares them. That's why you've had to deal with some of the things you've dealt with before. His aim is to keep you preoccupied, keep you too busy to get very serious. And of these, I can say that God has never stopped dealing with you, has he? No matter how far you may have strayed, God right. has never stopped dealing with you. Yes. He was never very far away. As a matter of fact, no matter how far away from God you got, you probably thought about God every day. There was a reason for that. So once again, you have a choice to say, I'm all in. There comes a time in the Christian life where we've learned enough. We've learned enough to either say, I'm too scared to turn it all over. I'm too afraid. Of, I know one guy told me, he said, I, I'm, I'm not going to preach because I don't want God to make my kids sick. I wonder if I need to bring this up or not. There's a uh, how I want to put this. You know, I wonder how many how many husbands have been saved because their wives got sick, a little sick, and nearly died, and the husband. Said, Lord, if you'll heal her, I'll serve you. I wonder if God would have come to the wife and said, I'm going to make you very, very ill, but I'm going to reach your husband through that. Would she agree? If she loved him, she would. Mm -hmm. right. You see, sometimes we're faced with things like this. There was a nine year old boy. <clears throat> 
very active. As a matter of fact, today they would give him pills because uh, he was one of these that couldn't be still, okay? He was always very energetic and uh, Ma, the, the mother happened to notice that he was just uh, sitting down um, and watching the kids play, he had his leg out straight like this and just watching the kids play. She said, what's wrong with that? You know, the only time he's not is when he runs fever or something. So she called him over there, he came and he didn't have any fever. She didn't, so she kind of dismissed it. And, um, noticed the, the teacher called and said, there's something not right uh, because uh, he's staying in from recess and he's not going out. So anyway, to, to, to cut through, they um, did some, uh, because his leg was hurting, they, they took some x-rays and found out he had bone cancer, nine years old, had bone cancer. His dad worked at a large, large factory. He was a supervisor there. The people that owned the, the factory, they, they sent St. Louis and had three doctors flown down to take a look at this. And, these doctors said, you know, um, to remove the leg would really serve no purpose. Um, you know, it's in his bloodstream, and uh, there's, he doesn't have that much longer to live. And um, they said the only thing that we could possibly do is, is if, if the parents would allow us, we could we would cut the back of his leg open and scrape the bone and use it for research in some way. Well, the, the family doctor said, absolutely not. You know, whatever time he's got left, he's going to live it without something like that. You know, I'm, I'm sorry that, that can't happen. The dad, who uh, was a pretty big sinner in his own right, he was an alcoholic, uh, cheated on the wife, more than once. He went to the chapel, fell down on his knees. He said, God, please don't take my younger son. And he said, if you'll heal him, I'll serve you. That nine-year-old boy was me. That was my dad. And that was my experience. And from that time, the doctors couldn't explain why I started getting better and not worse. I spent seven more days in the hospital when they sent me home. But my dad went back on his way. I don't remember this, but my mom told me, she said, when I, when I went up and told her, I said, listen, I, I, I've accepted the call to preach. She said, well, you told me when you were nine that when you got older, you are going to he was going to be a preacher and, and tell people how God heals you. I didn't even understand that. Yeah. But you know what? I got to pray with my dad. Yeah. Before he died, I got to pray with him. And I remember um, they were all going fishing, but they they didn't tell me about the fishing trip because they didn't want to invite the preacher. That was my dad and my brother. But you know, I got to pray with my brother too before he died. Yeah. You know what he said? He said, I should have been there a long time ago. Yeah. But his question to me was, you want to be saved? He said, you mean to tell me that I can live my life drinking, cussing, <coughs> gambling. I can live my life doing whatever I want to do. And now that I'm going to die, I can ask Jesus to be my Savior, and he's going to come and save me. I said, that's exactly what I'm saying. Amen. Yes. And we prayed and cried. There's some, some things we go through that aren't worth it. It's worth it. Yes. Serving God is going to be worth it. Yes, it whatever is. it may cost you. Yes, it is. Whatever road you have to go down, whatever you have to deal with, it's 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 time. We live in a time where the 
But you're not going to give your best now. Where's he going to? Where is he going to? What is it going to take for you to say, okay, God, I just bow all in. I'm all in. Yes, amen. Would you bow your heads, please? Richard, I want you to come and hand it over and do this. Not a person in this room when the sound of my voice knows this this morning. But many of the things that he has spoken behind his pulpit have been things I have been praying about because the Lord has laid them on my heart. It's confirmation. Confirmation. We are so close to the coming of the Lord. And yet the devil, like you talked about a few moments ago, is fighting like never before. Bombarding our minds. So you may remember the devotion I did a couple days ago on our thoughts. Because if the enemy can put some things in our mind and keep them there, they get into our heart, into our spirit, into our attitude, into our outlook, into our disposition, into our character. And then they begin to flow through our hands, through our actions, through our deeds, through our words. The word talked about a renewing of our mind. why it's so important to keep our minds renewed in the things of the Lord. Well, the man, I'm so glad that you had the opportunity to pray with your dad. I'm so glad you had an opportunity to pray with your brother. I've had those family members that I've, that I've had this opportunity at the, at the 11th hour. But I want to tell you something. We can't wait until the last moment and say, well, I'll live any way I want to. Thumb my nose at God. Thumb my nose at His Word. And at the very last minute, I'll just say a prayer. And I'll be all right. How many people have laid their head on the pillow at night never to wake up this side of eternity again. Or other things happen. Heart attack, stroke. A new breed. Men that left us a legacy to look at to learn from, to stand on. <clears throat> I feel the Holy Spirit moving right now, tugging at some hearts, whispering into your ear right now some things. How are you going to respond? Yes, Lord, I'm sorry. Yes, Lord, I've been wrong. Lord, forgive me. Help me not to ever do it again.
As I pray right now, Holy Spirit of God, that you would speak with love, compassion, and mercy. Those things that need to be said that will draw us to the foot of the cross. Where we can find everything we need. Because of what Jesus Christ did. Lord, forgive me. There's some things I, I need forgiveness. Lord, forgive me, I pray. Forgive me for attitude. Forgive me for bitterness, for unforgiveness. Forgive me for anything that doesn't line up with your word. Forgive me, I pray. Lord, I need deliverance. I need to be set free. The devil's got me in bondage. The devil's got me in captivity. The devil's got me, controls me through this thing. deliverance today to be released and set free. I need strength. I need peace. I need whatever you have need of this morning. It's yours. If you just right where you're at, night Bible study. We've got good news where it concerns our Wednesday night Bible study. Number one, we've got a, a bathroom working now. So we can have Bible study this Wednesday night. And the Legion has changed their monthly business meeting to another night to where now we can have Bible study the first Wednesday night Amen. of the month. Amen. So yes, this coming Wednesday is the first Wednesday night of the month, but we will be here, the Lord willing, and I believe with all my heart, unless the rapture takes place, it is His will. We will be here having Bible study this Wednesday night. I want you to please come. I will tell you something. If you put forth the energy, and if you put forth the effort, and if you'll sacrifice what you have to do to be in the house of God, to participate in studying the Word of God and learning more about the Word of God and what it takes to live a life that not only is pleasing to God, but a life that God can use in His service to touch others. You'll never regret coming to the house of God. I've come so tired sometimes I think I have to put one foot in front of the other and I'm left skipping and, and, and almost dancing. Be here next Sunday morning. The Lord has plans. And you're a part of that plan. Pray for one another this week. Speaking of prayer, we have an updated prayer list on the table in the back. Please get you the latest copy. I know some of these names are people that you don't know. But if you'll just speak their name, God knows them. He knows about the situation. Say, there's people on there I don't even know. 
I have people on Facebook. Hey, Pastor, would you have a church pray? Don't really know them. But they ask for prayer. We're a praying church. I believe in the power of prayer. We're praying for them. So get you, get you a list. Remember, prayer meeting Monday night at 7 o'clock. We want to pray together. Let's stand and be dismissed with the word of prayer.